Amen. Well, I'd like to finish <clears throat> what the Lord started sharing um, last night. And uh, to, I uh, hope that you had an opportunity to go into these Hebrews. It's in Hebrews 13, if you want to turn there. Hebrews 13. And we will specifically focus in on verses 10 through 13. And I um, hope that you had an opportunity to maybe look around, to dig around a little bit and say, Lord, what is it? What is it behind the veil of this? I see the... I see the obvious, what is it behind the veil? I want to go behind the veil. I want to see into your heart. I want, to, I want to know you in a real way. I don't want to just be a Christian. I want to be uh, consumed with you, as I will supposedly be doing throughout eternity. Um, so we're in Hebrews 13, and we'll begin with verse 10. We have an altar whereof they have no right to eat, which serve the tabernacle. For the body, uh, bodies of those beasts whose blood is brought into the sanctuary by the high priest for sin are burned outside the camp. Wherefore Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people with his own blood, suffered outside the gate. Let us go forth therefore unto him outside the camp, bearing his reproach. And in our last class, we looked at the reality that there's two groups here. There are two groups mentioned, and you see that in verse 10. We, we is one group. We have an altar. And they, whereof they have no right. Uh, so there's we and there's they, and the Spirit of God wants us to begin to divide that out and to see it in light of God's mind, his heart, his, his way of viewing things, which he's always viewed it that way because he set it in order. And we must leave our own views and the surface of these things and find him, find the Lord, find the Lord. Um, so uh, the we part, we, well, we, well, we have an altar. We have it. We have an altar. They, they, they would serve the tabernacle. In our altar, we partake. We partake. They have no right to eat. We partake. In their altar, they gain from it. They, and this is something you must realize, they who served the tabernacle and, and did the things that we talked about in Numbers 19, with all that the, the, the priest did, with all of that, God did not write into the statutes that they had a right to eat of it. That's important. It wasn't in there those who served the tabernacle, they weren't given the right to eat of it. Okay? So, <clears throat> verse 11, for the bodies of those beasts whose blood is brought into the sanctuary by the high priest of, for sin are burned outside the camp. So, that's a description of their ministry. That is a description of those who served the tabernacle. They took the bodies of those beasts whose blood they brought into the sanctuary by the high priest and he brought it in there for sin and then they were burned outside the camp. That's the ministry of they, those who serve the tabernacle, okay? And um, so it's, it's a specific kind of ministry. And we'll get into that and some of you have heard me share on this before. And, and we have to see the they not as sinners, not as people uh, uninvolved with the Lord, 
but as the priests who served the tabernacle. Okay, and this is this is giving us a clue what this is doing. Is it's a contrast of we and the altar that we've been given, and they and the ministry that they've been given. Okay, so the part that you've probably heard from me before that I've shared in a, in another study, it's in Ezekiel chapter forty. Um, we'll look at in chapter, a little bit in chapter, one verse actually in chapter 40. Then we'll look in chapter 43, a couple of three verses, and then we'll look in chapter 44, two verses, and then yeah, a few more after that. This is the prophet Ezekiel. And the chamber whose prospect is towards the north is the priests, the keepers of the charge of the altar. This is those, this is they, folks. This is those who serve the tabernacle. Okay? They're the keepers of the charge of the altars. These are the sons, well, this is, this is actually the sons of Zadok. These are the sons of Zadok among the sons of Levi, which come near to the Lord and minister unto him. So re you remember there was this contrast, and that's what we're reading about. There's these priests, and they were able to do certain things within the tabernacle, they served the tabernacle. But the sons of Zadok, the Zadok priesthood, they did what? They ministered to the Lord. Okay, that's important. Because this, we and they, is exactly what Hebrews 13, 13 and, and 10 through 13 is talking about. Okay, so Ezekiel 43 now, starting with verse 10. Thou son of man, show the house to the house of Israel, that they may be ashamed of their iniquities, and let them measure the pattern. So he's saying to those who minister to the house, he's saying, show them the house that they're supposed to be ministering to. They don't even understand their own ministry. And then verse um, 18, and he said unto me, Son of man, thus saith the Lord God, these are the ordinances of the altar in the day when they shall make it, to offer burnt offerings thereon and to sprinkle blood thereon, and thou shalt give to the priests, the Levites, that be of the seed of Zadok, which approach unto me to minister unto me, to minister unto me, to minister unto me, saith the Lord God, a young bullock for a sin offering. Their offering, now they and we, their offering to, for the people. The, the tabernacle, the house. Do you get it? That would be like if somebody was, if we were talking about um, uh, people coming over to help you out because you're going through a hard time and they started working on your house and painting the inside, painting the outside and doing all this kind of work. And another group of people, they came over and they sat down with you and started ministering to you. Well, that's the difference, folks, is so many of the Levites and the, men, the priests were relegated because of their heart, which we'll see in a minute, were relegated to only minister to God's stuff, to the house, to the people, sin offerings. You, you notice sin offerings for their sin or the sons of Zadok, which approach unto me, they approach me to minister to me a young bullock for a sin offering. They're ministering to him even in the sin offering. They're not just ministering to the people. Okay, let's go to Ezekiel 44 and verse, starting with verse 6. Thou shalt say to the rebellious, even the house of Israel, Thus saith the Lord God, O ye house of Israel, let it suffice you of all your abominations, in that you have brought into my sanctuary strangers, uncircumcised in heart and uncircumcised in flesh, to be in my sanctuary, to pollute it, even my house. When you offer my bread, the fat and the blood, they have broken my covenant because of all your abominations. Verse 10, And the Levites that are gone away from, far from me, 
When Israel went astray, went astray away from me after their idols, they shall even bear their iniquity. Yet, yet they shall be ministers in the sanctuary, having charge at the gates of the house and ministering to the house. They shall slay the burnt offerings and the sacrifice for the people, and they shall stand before them to minister unto them. Now verse 13. And they shall not come near unto me. They shall not come near unto me. To do the office of a priest unto me. Nor to come near to any of my holy things in the most holy place. But they shall bear their shame and their abominations which they have committed. But I will make them keepers of the charge of the house for all the service thereof and for all that shall be done therein. But the priests, the Levites, the sons of Zadok, that kept the charge of my sanctuary when the children of Israel went astray from me, they shall come near to me to minister unto me, and they shall stand before me to offer unto me the fat and the blood, saith the Lord God, they shall enter into my sanctuary and they shall come near to my table to minister unto me and they shall keep my charge. We and they. That's the, that's the thing. So, um, we go back to Hebrews 13 and if you look, uh, I should have told you to keep your place there, but I didn't because we're going to be there for a while. Hebrews 13 and verse 12. <clears throat> Wherefore Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people with his own blood, suffered outside the gate. Okay, So Jesus is in these verses, listen carefully, Jesus, first of all, is ministering to the house. In verse 12, it's ministry to the house. Okay? Ministry to the house. You, got, you, you see it right here. Uh, that he might sanctify the people. Uh, that, that that's his goal with the red heifer as understood by they. Because they have no right to eat of it. So he's ministering to the house. Okay. So first we see a similarity to the other group. Jesus also that he might sanctify the people. It's, a, it's for a water of separation for them. It is a purification for sin. And I wrote just a little sentence here. But the writer is not seeking to get us to be about ministry to the house. Not Hebrews 13. It's not, he's not, even though Jesus did that, we're going to see what the real ministry is about, okay? So he's showing the difference between those priests and us priests, or supposedly us priests. They always ministered in the sanctuary. They always did all of these things. They always kept up, you know. It's, it would be like a wife that basically keeps a clean house but really doesn't pay much attention to her husband. So um, it, it's showing that difference there. And then verse 13. But let us go forth there for unto him outside the camp, bearing his reproach. Here, here is ministry unto him. It's not ministering to the house. See, and Jesus is also the fulfillment of the red heifer. Even though he ministered to the people, he did that to put that away. That was an ending of that so that the new priest, if you will, if I can put it like that, would come in and they would partake of, of him and of the altar. They would partake. They wouldn't just minister to the people. They wouldn't just make their whole thing. And, you know, um, uh, their whole thing is, well, I've, I'm ministering to the people. I'm ministering to the people. No, that was the old covenant. That's the old way. That's the old priesthood. That's the one that was put away. And the whole book of Hebrews is all about that. 
you know. And, and the subject in that, in that whole book of Hebrews, just like this one is, that he's the fulfillment of this. So if you want to understand this, you've got to know him. These, he's the fulfillment of the offerings. He's the fulfillment of the law. He's the fulfillment. He, he, he. Well, what, what about Moses? He's just a shadow of this reality. Well, what about, you know, all of these most important religious things are done away in that sense because Christ has come. All right. So. We have an altar. It's not talking about an altar for sin. It's not talking about an altar for sin. It's talking about this other altar. Uh, it's an altar of joining with him as a sacrifice. It's an altar of coming to him, bearing his image, giving him what he created us for in the first place. Let us make man in our image after our likeness. It is I'm going to say it like this. I don't know. if It's probably not the best way to say it. It is the highest test. Just like probably the cross was the highest test for the Son of God. It is the highest test because we, we are so self-centered. We are so used to Jesus being about ministry to the house. We're so consumed with that. We're so, our first thought, we read scriptures and our first thought, we think of us, you know, the sin offering, but the sons of Zadok don't. They think of him. And, and like the scripture that I read, it's actually ministering to him. If we, but we have to, you have to, you have to love him above yourself you have to love him above your ministry you have to love him above all those things that that we have assumed are important and that we give ourselves to and that that we might even be diligent in those things and we give ourselves to those things those things those things not sinful things but things of his house and we think that that's, that's it. That's the, you know. And because I have a ministry and you have a ministry, we're both ministering to the, the, the house, but I assume mine's more important than yours because it's mine. We're, we're consumed with ourselves. We're consumed with, with um, ministry that will um, uh, have good feedback. Uh, if you lay hands on somebody and they, they get healed, woohoo, you know, spread the word, I'm a healer, you know, or whatever. I mean, it, it, there's little, very little glory goes back to God, you know. You all remember, remember the story on Bolivar, don't you? We were on Bolivar and we had an altar call and I mean some big sin, uh, um, healings and miracles happened and Karen Gentry was one of them and, and uh, so we ended that service and all that week, rumors were spreading all over Denton that there was healing going on and, you know, and Randy Nussbaum, you know, laid hands on these people and they were healed. And that Sunday morning, Cassie was just a little girl, little bitty girl. I walked up behind that pulpit and I said, there are vicious rumors going on in this city about us and about me in particular. And I said, they are lies. They are lies. And I'm like, oh, what is that? I said, people are saying I healed somebody. I wouldn't know how to heal anybody if I had the information. It wouldn't work. Jesus did that. And Jesus didn't do it to affirm me or this church. He did it for his own purposes. And I was vehement. And they were all like, Okay, we won't say that anymore, you know. Because what a, it was a vicious lie. Can I get an amen on that one? 
That's just a, a lie. And, and I'm, I'll have no part in it. But we do have an altar. We do have an altar. And let's see, I wrote down the priest. We are supposed to be, the ones that we're supposed to be, are not here for our sin. Now, that is particularly, particularly um, apropos for the gathering every year, all the time. The emphasis is Jesus. It's not about me. It's not about you. It's not about, you know, uh, what, it's not even about what we did for Jesus. Amen. It's about the Jesus we did it for. Amen. Amen. <laughs> you know, it's, there's a difference. Anybody see a difference there? There's a difference between that. You know, what I did for Jesus or the, uh, uh, the Jesus that I did it for. Yeah. You know, well, here's what I did. Let me, let me just say something to you. There are people in this room and, and in this fellowship that I cannot tell you the extremes that they have gone to to make this thing such that it would glorify Jesus. They've lost sleep. They've probably have some people get sick, all kind of different things. But onward they went because if it doesn't happen a certain way, it's not going to be a sweet incense to the Lord. It's not going to glorify Him. And, and I see those hearts. And I, I don't just see people doing stuff. I don't see slave labor. I see hearts, and I see hearts that give themselves uh, the extra mile and the extra mile and the extra mile. So um, we're here for him. Let us go forth unto him. Let's just go, let's just go to him. That's, you know. Well, there's, you know, I mean, yeah, let's get out there. Because that one verse in Hebrews 13 there affirmed that he'd ministered. He went into death for the house, but then he's still outside the camp and the house is over there inside. And he's waiting for a few people to understand really what's, what's about to happen and what this thing's going to be about. You know, we go out and we go, well, you know, they kicked me out, so I'm out here and I'm, I'm super righteous. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, I'm really special because they rejected me or whatever. Nobody's been rejected. Nobody's been rejected. Um, we, or we go out there and we go, yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go out there into him and then just throw my arms around him and give him a big hug. Let me just say this. Lord, help me say this properly. It is one thing to minister unto Jesus as if we are comforting him. It is quite another thing to go out unto Jesus bearing his reproach happily just to be with him. One can be somebody who's totally made whole. Everything's wonderful and everything. And I think I'm just going to go minister to Jesus. I'm just going to hug him up. You know, I'm going to love him up. <laughs> you know, and he's going to be so happy. Okay, now you picture that compared to someone who has been... Uh, 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 rejected and, and beat and scorned and hated for just the people may not know that they're doing it for against him but and he comes out to Jesus and says what a privilege it is to be out here with you bearing your reproach what do you think the difference is you know anybody see a difference you know I mean, one of them, we get all romantic. We go, especially the girls. Ooh, I'm going to just love him. And he's going he's gonna to love me. 
<laughs> I don't know what he's going to. He might kind of go, uh, uh, could we just talk for a minute, you know? <laughs> Peel you off of him. <clears throat> but when he sees that which is him in someone who has embraced him, they have come to him. They have come not even bearing their own reproach. It's not theirs. I mean, they can, you can do that. You can get reproached because you're a knucklehead or something and, you know, and go to him and go, well, oh, I'm bearing his reproach. He really likes me. It's not the same. It's not even close. In fact, it is very, very far. It's not, it's not the altar that we have. That's, that's not the altar that we have. It is when we have come to this place. So let us go forth unto him. Yes, he wants us to be there, you know, with him. He wants us to be willing to go. You know, because I mean, you're on the inside, I mean, who knows what's going on in Jerusalem? It could be a big party or whatever. He wants us to be willing to leave that. And as people are throwing rocks at us and saying, you're an idiot and all this, why are you believing that kind of stuff? You know? And you, and you, don't, you don't explain, you don't try to convince them. You just want to join in his sacrifice or in his nature of the lamb, the one who was and is and is to come, who was before the foundation of the world, who is a slaughtered lamb right now. And when he returns, it will be the sla slaughtered lamb sitting on that throne. The one who was and is and is to come, folks, is a slaughtered lamb. So let's go out the camp, outside the camp. That's, that's what it says right here. But again, not let's just go to him. Let's go outside the camp. Let's leave the camp, okay? Let's, let's leave the camp of uh, happy, blessed, pampered, Christianity that only use him and let's follow the lamb wherever he goes not just you know we would follow him in our life we look at the lamb as like somebody a slaughtered lamb up on the throne and then every once in a while there's situations that come into our life that we go well this must be one of those for the lamb this must be so i'm going to be lamb like and at best you're trying to get him to follow you in your moments instead of follow him wherever he goes that's a big difference too a lot of differences tonight right when you say <laughs> big difference you know let us go outside the camp bearing his reproach and then and then let his this is going to be hard to understand let his reproach work for you instead of you resisting it did you know that that can work for you did you know that yeah Oh, well, you know, I'm just, how about I just close with a couple of scriptures? What, what we want to see here is a completely different spirit at, at work in Paul and Peter and these different ones. They just, they just comprehended this whole thing differently. They saw it differently. I mean, I think modern day Christianity has polluted us. And we think that this is what Jesus is really pleased with. Right. And, and we must because we're all doing it, you know. 2 Corinthians 12, 5. He talks about coming to revelations, revelation, you know, having a bunch of deep things taught. 
Verse 5, he says, Of such a one will I glory, yet of myself I will not glory, but in mine infirmities. Okay. Um, to glory in your infirmities is not to be some sort of idiot. Okay? Excuse me. But it's not, you know, it's not like you're working with a handsaw and you cut off a couple of your fingers and you go, hey, hey this is great. You know, <laughs> you know, I glory in this. You know, that's got nothing to do with Jesus. It's got nothing to do with loss for him in that sense. You, you see what I'm saying? It's got, you know, but, but if you're being attacked, if they're acting like, like, I mean, like Stephen, and they're gnashing on him with their teeth. I mean, come on. I mean, that's pretty, you know, <laughs> that's apocalyptic stuff there. <laughs> you know, walking dead kind of stuff. <laughs> you know, that, is, that, ain't, that ain't right. I mean, that ain't normal. Uh, but look at him. Look at him. Look at him. He's not going, get him off of me. Get him off of me. You know, he's just looking up into the, into the face of the Lord. Not even to heaven. I mean, he's looking at Jesus and he sees Jesus standing there. And he says the same words, you know, don't hold this to their charge. Isn't that beautiful? Okay, well, if you see a bunch of people, blood running down their mouth because they're chomping on your shoulder, think about what you just said, <laughs> what you agreed with here. But, but he, that really happened, folks. And, and Paul in this, these verses are just saying, look, I'm telling you, uh, I figured this out. I used to rebuke the devil, uh, whether it was the devil or not. <laughs> you know, every trial, everything I didn't like, every person, I rebuke you, I rebuke you, I rebuke you. Anybody ever go through that phase where you just flat rebuked everything? <laughs> But you did it in the name of Jesus and you felt good about it, you know. Uh, verse 9, he says, and he said unto me, my grace, because remember, he asked three times, the Lord, take this away. And the Lord kept saying, my grace is sufficient for thee. And, and you know, I don't know what Paul did for sure at that moment, but I'm, I'm thinking I would go, now, how is this involved? Where's your grace involved in this? That you're not taking this away, that you've kind of opened the door for the devil to mess with me. Uh, how is this, you know, you sent a, 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 a spirit to buffet me. <laughs> My grace is sufficient for you. We need new definitions of grace. We need new definitions of grace. The scriptures say of Jesus, by the grace of God, he tasted death for every man. Man, all right? My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. This is the Lord saying to him, my strength is made perfect in weakness. Do you believe that? Okay, that's great. I know most of you believe that. I'm real proud of you for believing that. But when you get in circumstances, do you, anybody know where I'm going up next when I say this? When you get in circumstances, does what you believe kick in? In other words, it's like, you know, it's, it's like having a, a, a tire pump back there in case you ever get a flat. And then, you know, you're driving down the road or you're on the freeway and all of a sudden you have a flat and you have to pull over in a little bitty lane and cars are... <laughs> do you go, uh, uh, praise God, I've got, you know, I've got a tire pump. No, we go, oh God, dude, this is horrible, this is the worst situation could ever happen. Don't laugh at me, you know you do that stuff. You know, I'm looking at you, you think I can't see right through this thing. <laughs> Most gladly, therefore, will I rather. Most gladly, would I rather Glory in my infirmities, that the power of Christ may rest upon me. You say, well, explain that. How long you been around? <laughs> this is pretty much all I've preached for so many years. 
Um, that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities and reproaches and necessities. Wait a minute, back it up. In reproaches, let us go unto him bearing his reproach. That's what it's talking about when it's talking about here. This is all talking about oneness with him. This is talking about, and how does that oneness work? It works by you being one with the Lord instead of being you in that situation. I don't like these infirmities or those people are reproaching me. That's you. That's you. That's you. That's you. And it's not, it's, it's a, it's a, it's definitely a, something's rising, but it's not a sweet savor. It's a raunchy poop smell to the glory of nobody and the Lord's just going it's almost like you know if I'm doing that it's almost like he's just reaching down and going hey buddy I mean, like this big old hand hey buddy don't be preaching that stuff if you don't intend on putting it to work pull, pull out the tire pump you know, don't talk about having one and then rejoice and then not use it. <clears throat> um, I, and I'll just say this. You know, this stuff that, that we've been sharing here, we've been sharing about um, First Peter, we've been talking about, um, you know, going through the court or going through the sufferings of Christ and the spirit that we're supposed to have it in. And and uh, there are evildoers attacking us and stuff. Well, I'll just tell you that three days before this thing started, I had a big bad one come against me. Big bad one. The kind that can knock you for a loop. And it took me a good day and a half to <laughs> wrestle that sucker to the ground and get back where I most gladly, I, I take this, I'm with you, Lord, I am not gonna respond back, I am not gonna do things or say things or, or go over here and justify or talk to this person or whatever. I am going to, you know, and number one, I saw it as what a wonderful opportunity this is because, and the, I am sure the Lord allowed it I am sure that he ushered it in there, probably serenaded it right into me. And I just saw, well, I can really, I mean, because you know, you know and I know this, these things can crawl up on your back and it's hard to get them off. I knew if I, would get, if I don't get this thing now and quickly, as quickly as I can, it's this gathering is going to stink. Because I'm going to have that odor on it, you know. I said, I can't do that. I can't do that for, for them. And I can't do that for, for the Lord. And I can't do that for me. I do want the Lord. And this is a, see, you have to see it as that opportunity. I will most gladly see. Um, the power of Christ may rest upon me. Okay, it's a different kind of power. Can I get an amen on that one? Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities and uh, uh, in reproaches and necessities. I just saw reproaches. I, I guess I dropped the P there, and it looks like re-roaches in my mind. <laughs> the roaches are coming back. Necessities and per persecutions and distresses, for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then am I strong. Okay, Galatians 6.14, but God forbid that I should glory save or accept in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world is crucified unto me and I unto the world. Good, good doctrine, isn't it? That's some good doctrine. But do you think God's really into us having good doctrine? You know, that we got a sign over there, something that says, uh, uh, he desires truth in the inward parts, something like, I can't see it because the whole thing, not just truth in the, in the head. Or in the doctrine. Second Timothy 2, 9, 12. Wherein I suffer trouble as an evildoer. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. 
They think you're the evildoer. <laughs> Isn't that hilarious? Wherein I suffer, this is 2 Timothy 2, 9 through 12. Wherein I suffer trouble as an evildoer, even under bonds. But the word of God is not bound. Therefore I endure all things for the elect's sake. See that? You're, 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 you're doing it by Christ. You understand? You're not doing it. You're doing it by Christ. But it's going to benefit. He calls the, the evildoers the elect. <laughs> he calls the evildoers the elect's sake. And he calls himself or that he's an, looked upon as an evildoer. Uh, that they may also obtain the salvation which is, in Jesus, which is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. It is a faithful saying, for if we be dead with him, we shall also live with him. And if we suffer, we shall also reign with him. If we deny him, he will also deny us. So we say, okay, you know, um, uh, when I... When I go on my job, you know, I'm, I'm working, I'm doing my job, you know, and there's a fellow worker there and they say, uh, uh, are you, so are you a Christian? And you go, uh, no, you know, because you, <laughs> you say, you're not a Christian? No, I'm not a Christian, you know. Uh, is your name Peter? <laughs> no, no. Because <laughs> you got one more chance. <laughs> Um, uh, so we think that's we think that's what this is. If we deny him, he will deny us. That's what we think that's about. That's about as bad as it gets for an American Christian, <laughs> which is super sad, isn't it? Uh, but this is says this says all of verse twelve is this: If we suffer. Uh, we shall also reign with him. But if we deny him, because we're not going to suffer. See, there's no period in the new sentence there. There's a, there's a colon. It's all one thought. If we suffer with him, we shall reign with him. If we deny him, we won't, we won't go through these things with him by his spirit and in his way. Well, he's going to also deny us. Well, I don't know what that he, he'll deny. I don't know if that's on judgment day or what. I don't. I don't know. Uh, you, you know, people always go, well, well tell, I need to know that. And I'm going, no, you don't. If you're going to go with the Lord, you don't need to know it because it doesn't apply. I mean, that's the way I think. I, it's terrible, isn't it? Don't I, Tessie? <laughs> it's like, well, you just adding, you know, extra worries to you. Just go for the Lord and you won't have to worry about all that junk behind you, you know. All right, Romans, uh, we only got two more uh, places we're going. Romans 8, and I'm saying this so that, you know, you'll know this right now is my first ending. Ending number one. Romans 8, verse 35 through 39. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Okay, well, you do understand the love of Christ is not that he, he really, really ooey gooey's you. Who's going to separate me from that? No, he's talking about what the, I think the actual wording is what shall separate us, at least in the King James, isn't it? What shall separate us from the, anyway, um, uh, the love of Christ is by this perceive we the love of God because he laid down his life for us and we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren, okay? So to the Lord, when he said he laid down his life, it's not you know, it's not our American version of that. It's Jesus literally went to death for, for no one who was righteous and no one who would truly be with him. Okay. And the vast majority would hate him and deny him and do everything they can to see him out of the picture. <clears throat> Shall tribulation... Or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword. So no, if if this is the love of Christ, that you bear that for people who don't deserve it, how can these things separate you from it? Yeah. They can't. 
It's impossible because those are the kind of things that are handy <laughs> at demonstrating the love of Christ. Tribulation, distress, persecution, famine, nakedness, or peril, or sword. Verse 36, as it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. Really? Are we? Well, there are plenty of opportunities. You know, we go, well, I'm, I'm just waiting. I'm waiting for it to come. <laughs> you know, I'm waiting for that opportunity. I'll be with the Lord. They, they probably hit you two or three times a day of things that either are not your preference or uh, that you don't particularly like or that, that you think that that shouldn't be that way or, or this person shouldn't have said that or, uh, you know, all that kind all that. That's the whirlwind of, of garbage or that's the stuff wherein we can prove that we're not separated from the love of Christ. We're manifesting it. Does that even make sense to y'all? That's this is good preaching. I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna listen to this afterwards. You think I'm bragging on myself? I'm not. <clears throat> okay. Um, you know, uh, as it is written, we are for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are accounted. We are accounted. We are looked upon as sheep for the slaughter. Okay, well, that's that's true, basically. But on the other hand, you are not just a conqueror that's killing them back. You're more than a conqueror by the power of Christ and by the power of his death and his life and his way and his mind. Nay, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. There it is. It's not just through him, well, through Jesus somehow, or through him that loved me because he loves me so I know that it's all going to be okay. That's not what it's saying. We are more than conquerors through him that loved us and that love is coming out of us. See? I mean, you get that? You, get, you know where you get that? You get that in Galatians 2.20 and particularly the second half of Galatians 2.20. The life I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I live by that. I am crucified with Christ so that he will live now. Because he died that I, I could live. Well, this is the life he wants me to live so that he can live. So that, so that he can die, as it were, again and again and again so that we can live. So that we can die again and again so that we can live in the... The realm of God being love. Uh, for I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate me from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. So, you know, it's not, again, it's not talking, uh, there's nothing that can separate me from being a Christian. It's not saying that. It's saying there is nothing that comes your way that you can't apply his life in this way. This, this crucified lamb, this slaughtered lamb. There's nothing. All the things that we would think are the worst things are actually something to gl be glad about and be able to get into. Now, you know, it, it, like I said, just recently, it took me a good day and a half. And I don't know, maybe two. I don't know. Uh, and I would figure maybe it'd take you a week or a month or some of you 10 years. <laughs> it, it may not happen as quickly for you, but it's there. Do you know that it's there? We have an altar. We have this altar that we can bear his reproach and go to him. All right, uh, this is my second ending, and it's 2 Corinthians 6, chap uh, chapter 6, verse 4. <clears throat> 2 Corinthians 6, starting with verse 4 through 10. But in all things, approving ourselves as the ministers of God. Well, wait till you see how he approves himself as the minister of God. Wait till you see 
Okay, real quick, give me a checklist. Uh, just put a little parchment down and a pencil in your head and just write down how, what are the things that we think are the things that approve somebody for the ministry of God. Just jot it down real quick. Well, it's this and it's that and it's this. And, you know, he's got to be able to preach good. And, you know, he's got to, you know, he's got to be cool nowadays. <laughs> you know, it used to be, you know, he had to be. Well, yeah. Anyway, so many things. Okay. Paul, give us your list, buddy. And all things approving ourselves as the ministers of God in much patience, in afflictions, in necessities, in distresses, in stripes, meaning beaten on the back, imprisonments, in tumults, in labors, in watchings. He is, this is his proof. This is his proof that he's a minister of God. I mean, when they said, they don't, you know, these people don't call me an apostle, they don't think I'm an apostle, you know. Well, I'll tell you, I'm an apostle. And he lists off another <laughs> list about like this one, you know, and this is the proof. I'm, I'm really, I really belong to the Lord. I mean, really. And they go, you seem like a criminal to me. <laughs> Nobody likes you. You know, the Lord likes you. The Lord loves you. The Lord wants you to come unto him in that and y'all just be together and, and, and you partake. You're, what are you doing? You're partaking of that altar. You're not talking about it. You're not preaching it. You're not believing it. You are, but I mean, you're partaking of it and going unto him outside the camp, bearing that reproach and happy as happy can be that you get to really be with Jesus instead of inside the camp deceiving yourself that just, you know, that, that building something, you know, with a, with a building and, and hymn books or whatever and, or, or, you know, praise hymns or whatever, all these things that we think that proves it. And he says... You don't, you know, you apparently are still in the tabernacle ministering according to that, and everybody's getting this. And again, I, I do. I get attacked. People say all the time, you know, well, you know, there's more to, there's more to the gospel than preaching Christ. <laughs> I mean, I'm just like, thank God I ain't part of it. Because if we're dead, all that stuff you're talking about has absolutely no value at all. And you are dead. The problem is, is that you won't embrace it. All right. I didn't finish these verses, did I? Verse 6, or verse, uh, last thing in verse 5, in fastings. My wonderment is, is he just running out of food and therefore turning it into fasting? I mean, that could be the case. He could, just, he could just transform this into a fast for the Lord. Hallelujah. By pureness, by knowledge, by long-suffering, long-suffering. I don't, you know, we see that a lot, and I just don't think we understand long-suffering. We understand a little suffering. We understand as soon as a little suffering show up, we need to get God on the scene to minister to the house. Us. You see that? By kindness, that's by the Holy Ghost, by love unfeigned, by the word of truth, by the power of God, by the armor of righteousness on the right hand and on the left. See, he's telling you what he's got and what he's going through. Do you see the difference there? He's, you know... It's like there's all this terrible stuff, and he's going, well, I, I got some stuff, too. I got long-suffering. <laughs> I can do without, you know, and turn it into something good. Uh, I can stay pure it's like a compass. A compass is pure. You understand that? A compass is pure. You hit that baby, and it'll spin around, but it always comes back to the north. And... Uh, that compass in your heart has to be set for Jesus, for Jesus, for Jesus, for Jesus. 
not the religious Jesus. You got to find the real Jesus. Because, and that, and Paul's found him. And God said, let's put it in the book. And then he said, obey, you know, read the word, get it in you. And we, well, how many times have we read this and said, hmm, praise God, <laughs> you know. Uh, he's got the power of God. He's got the word of truth. He's got the armor of righteousness. He's got the Holy Ghost. Man. And verse 8, um, by honor and dishonor, by evil report and good report. It sounds like it doesn't matter which one comes. It matters to us, and if it still matters to us, then there's a problem. Well, I heard an evil report about you. Well, you know, uh, I could tell you some bad stuff about me. Would you like to hear? You know, I bet you I, bet you I can give you worse stuff than you can tell me that they said. You know, I'm not afraid of that. I mean, folks, what are they going to do? You say, well, they might kill you. No, they probably won't, you know. Well, they'll, they'll ruin your reputation until everybody believes the worst of you and they hate you, and then you'll become homeless and you'll grow your hair out and grow a beard and you'll... Oh, I've already done that. Uh, <laughs> What is the, you know, the same God whose hand and heart is on me and in me is going to be in me in those situations too, isn't he? Yeah. I mean, come on. If we could just be real. But we can be real when we hear it preached. But when the fear comes, then we go, I don't know. I don't know if I want to go with this, you know. Um, by honor or dishonor, by evil report or good report. It really doesn't matter. As deceivers and yet true. As unknown, you know, well, who ever heard of New Creation Fellowship? You know, or who ever heard of your little ministry? As unknown and yet well known. Where? In the, let's see, at least three people I can think of. <laughs> <laughs> well known as dying and behold we live <laughs> that's what I'm talking about there that's, what, there that's something you hold on to as dying and yet we live can you believe that's the problem we can't believe that if all that massive terror and all that junk happens um that I, I will be ruined on the inside too. No, as, as dead, but yet we live. As dying, yea, and yet we live. As chastened, okay, well, you know, you, you may look to everybody else like God hates you. That's how Jesus was viewed. Did God hate him? No. He's still... You know, people go, he said, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? He did say, my God. <laughs> I mean, God, that's three. <laughs> he's, still in the, he's still in the pack. <laughs> you know? <laughs> he didn't say, I'm, I'm out. Am I out from the Godhead now? <laughs> yeah, you know. <laughs> Then we would all worry, okay? Yeah. <laughs> when Jesus starts slipping like that, we, we got problems, folks. <laughs> As chastened and not killed. See, we can't do that. Well, somebody, somebody chastened me, you know? Well, they didn't kill you. <laughs> Come on. You're making it way worse than what it is. <laughs> uh, and finally, verse 10, as sorrowful, yet always rejoicing, as poor, yet making many rich, as having nothing, and yet possessing all things. Let us, let us partake of the altar that we have and go unto him bearing his reproach and give him his heart's desire, not just comfort, but comforted by fruit, one after his kind. That's what he started, he wanted, and that's what he wants in the end. 
Let's pray. <clears throat> Father, I, I know how these things must sound to some whose ears have not been circumcised, whose hearts are yet to be circumcised. But how strange they sounded to me when I read them out of the Bible, when I read them concerning one of your, as it were, most prized people, Paul or, or Peter, or, and the things that they went through. And, and Father, I, I understand that, I do. But Father, may you give hearing ears I mean, Jesus, you said many things in your ministry and in the book of Revelation. He that hath ears to hear, let him hear. Father, we ought to be praying down here for hearing ears. We ought to be, every one of us. Father, this Jesus tribe, this church, ought to be praying hard for hearing ears, to grasp it in such a way that they're just bold as a lion in the sense of holding steady with what's true in you regardless of the circumstances. Father, that's what B.B. was singing about in the midst of extreme circumstances. She was talking about not singing about not being moved being with you, even though it's there, even though it hurts. It is fellowship and in sufferings. But it is the highest to be one with you in your nature. And, and it is easy for men and religious men and women, it's easy for us to, to do good things and to expect good things back and, and to expect that we, we would tithe and therefore we would get, you know, a hundredfold or sixtyfold, whatever we think, and get something back. Or, or that we would go to church and expect that you would take care of our family just because we're doing that. While we miss and, and, and just miss the mark. Oh my God, we miss the mark of what this whole thing's about because we have believed, we have believed what the average church claims is how we should live. But Christ is how we should live. Christ crucified is on the throne. The slaughtered lamb was glorified above everything else and everybody else at least has enough sense to worship that. It seems like everybody in heaven, as it were, if you look at Revelation in that way, that everybody in heaven at least has figured out worthy is the lamb instead of glory to the risen king. Father, give us, those of us in this fellowship that are longing for this, give us those hearing ears and then beyond that. Father, give us that sword of the Spirit. Father, I was reading in Revelation yesterday and read again Oh, the word had gone forth at the, in chapter 19, Armageddon's coming and all the disaster and all of the deaths and all of the fowls of the air eating flesh and everything. And when the scriptures write that event down, it just says, he that sat upon the throne or on the white horse they, they took the false prophet and they took the beast and they put him in, in hell. They locked him up. 
and hell. There was, it didn't mention any fight. It just, it just said they, well, they just took them. It's like they just walked up and took them. <laughs> they had all these armies. And then it says, and then it says, he that rode upon the, high, or the white horse, all it says is destroyed the rest. I'm not sure of the exact words, but it was basically that. Destroyed the rest, meaning all the armies that had gathered with the sword that proceeded out of his mouth. That's it. That was it. Nobody else did any fighting. Wasn't a big battle. It was pretty simple. <laughs> it scares us. We go, oh no, not Armageddon. Maybe that's what's going on. Pandemic and earthquakes and fires and hurricanes, maybe. But Lord, there is nothing to worry about. It's, it's so easy <laughs> when we have you and your mind enthroned in us. And if we don't, our fears will rule everything. So, Father, I pray that as the body of Christ, that within this group, you will, as I said, give hearing ears, and from there, work it in, work it in, work it in, until they have the sword of the Spirit. And all enemies are simply slain by the word that is within them that is sharp and comes out and it cuts down all those fears and it cuts down all that stuff. It cuts it down and it cuts down on the amount of it that starts coming anymore. So Father, let us enter into glory before we enter into glory. Let us enter into the glory of the slaughtered lamb. Let us be willing to go out of the camp and not just have to look righteous in the eyes of men out there, people out there, churches out there. But we are what you want. And that's good enough for us. Father, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen.